to the second to last session of the day. Uh, Daniel Vetter has been a kernel developer and was, was the maintainer of the Intel uh, graphics kernel driver, and he's here to offer a retrospective on his experiences. Um, I'd like to preface this talk with a content warning that there will be a discussion of sort of abusive patterns of behavior, so just make sure that you're ready for that. And um, we'd like you to please hold your questions until the end of the talk. Um, and yeah, now everyone please uh, join me in welcoming Daniel to the stage. Oh, this, this is going to be a, um, a rather more personal talk than what I usually give, because uh, essentially it's, it's my story of uh, starting with, with kind of seeing kernel maintainers and kernel developers as my heroes. Uh, I mean, they, they've... They, I've started following kernel, kernel communities in like high school. This is essentially how I learned how operating systems worked. Uh, and, and they've done this awesome free operating system and we're discussing all this stuff in, in the open and public and, and this was awesome and inspiring. And uh, eventually I started hacking and kind of scratching my own itch on, on the kernel and the graphics subsystem. Uh, Quite a bit later, got hired uh, to work on it professionally. A very small team. Um, somehow got volunteered for being the girl maintainer for that team, and then uh, that team grew uh, grew uh, grew quite rapidly within one two years, from from like three people total to twenty. Uh, that was was a tough lesson in in learning that leading teams is about leading people, and. I also started to kind of realize that the way kernel maintainers work, it, it, it makes me unhappy, it makes the people unhappy, and, and I started to, to learn how broken this is, and uh, I want to share a bit of my story, uh, and of course there's going to be a bit of history fixing because chronological stories are generally a bit boring, so I'm going to mix it up, make it more, more interesting. Uh, about yeah, how I learned how, how broken this is and, and how um, unlikely I think it's going to improve anytime soon. So, with that, what's, what's broken with the kernel community? And uh, generally, the first thing that comes up is kind of the discussion culture, like Linus swearing at someone. And, uh, that's encoded in, in this document that happened a few years ago called Code of Conflict, which essentially tells you if you want to contribute to the Linux kernel, um, you will get shredded for the greater good of the project. So expect that. And there's a, a follow-on paragraph that says, so if you're really uncomfortable, then maybe you can report this to this technical advisor board, and they might not be able to do a whole lot about it. And if you talk with, with kernel maintainer at, at Linux conference and stuff like that, when, when they bring up that, hey, Daniel, it, it's, it's become much better in the past few years. Generally, what I mean is, is, is the, the kind of rather violent language and, and discussion uh, approach in the kernel community. But I think that's not the real problem. It's, it's a bit the surface thing, it's one aspect of the problem. And for that, uh, we need to do the first interlude to, to a book I read uh, last year. I highly recommend to not read this alone. It's tough stuff. Uh, and it's titled, Why Does He Do That? Inside the, man of, of angry and, uh, inside the Minds of Angry and Controlling Men. Uh, it's been a guy who's done for decades professional counseling for people who have uh, who are in personal relationship, abusers from personal relationships who've made a hard encounter with the justice system. And the interesting thing is not so much the story he's telling, but the archetypes of abusers that he's extracting from these, all these stories he's seen over like 30 plus years. Um, and even more interesting, kind of the, the patterns that abusers engage in so that they can keep uh, staying in power, 
uh, because if everyone would know what they're really doing, uh, it would generally stop really quickly. And the core takeaway I have from that book uh, is fundamentally what is, what is app use. Um, I guess just two bits. Uh, one thing is that app user needs to have power over their victim, otherwise this just doesn't work. And this can be maybe they're earning the money, maybe they have some blackmail. And in the kernel, uh, in the kernel case, uh, I would definitely say uh, kernel maintainers have a lot of power over their contributors. The kernel is, is very hierarchical. Uh, kernel maintainers, except in really extreme cases, which tend to take years to unfold and maybe eventually get resolved, their, their rejection rights is absolute. So if you want to get something into upstream, you have to deal with the kernel maintainer of that subsystem. So they have considerable uh, power uh, in the upstream community. And the second bit that, that makes abuse, abuse isn't violence, uh, but it's, it's controlling behavior. Now, of, of course, like violence is extremely controlling behavior, as in it, it controls uh, the physical safety of, of a victim. So, uh, where, when someone is, is safe and one not from violence. But it's totally not necessary. For example, um, if you're doing martial arts, that's a rather violent thing. It's also, if done properly, rather respectful uh, pastime. So, a lot of abusive patterns that uh, or explain in, in, the, in, in the book, or why does he do that, are about nonviolent controlling behavior. And that really can be anything, like in personal relationships, is like who you're allowed to go out with, who's allowed to be your friend, who you're allowed to talk to. That's an extreme sort of restriction of, of, of your freedom, of your agency, and as generally doesn't require violence. It's not getting beaten up. So, what I'd like to highlight in, in the first part of the talk is kind of the kinds of controlling behaviors I've seen in the kernel communities that maintainers are using uh, to kind of pester and uh, dictate what their contributors can do and what they cannot do. And uh, the very first thing is only technical topics are in scope for the Linux kernel community. Uh, and that's just nonsense. That what it actually means is contributors are only to allowed to talk about the technical stuff, but maintainers, on the other hand, they're like engaging in the full spectrum of emotions. But some kernel maintainers, that's like anger and explosions and, and screaming and shouting. But other maintainers are more like, uh, I expect to, you to, to like give me emotional support because I'm so terribly overloaded and your own emotions and your own uh, feelings and user problems are totally irrelevant. Um, there's also maintainers that engage in quite a bit of microaggression and nagging and epic amounts of bike shedding until you are uh, version 20 of your patch series. So th this there's a, a wide spectrum of this one side of the fair of officially it's only about the technical stuff, but maintainers are totally free to do whatever uh, kind of emotional state they have it uh, and impose that on their contributors and their mailing list. And it's, this is like a classic uh, controlling behavior of I tell you when, when you can cry and not tell you when you can feel sad and when you should be happy and all that things. And it's also, on the flip side, my emotions as someone in charge and control as, as a kind of abusing party, uh, they matter and yours are like irrelevant. But, but that's not the only thing. What this also creates by insisting that non-technical discussions are not in scope are you make any kind of discussions about go governance and community and maybe fixing this uh, off topic. Which means, if you're a maintainer in this community and you feel uncomfortable with the way it works, you want to chat with other people, it's very hard to have these conversations. 
because variations happen. And what it also kind of creates is, since it's only about the technical, it's not about the people, it's not about the feeling, uh, things like leading peoples and teams is just not valued as a contribution to the kernel. So in a way, it creates a negative space for, for, for leadership. Um, another thing that is rather common is making things personal. So as a maintainer, you're personally responsible for all the regressions, all the failings, all the things that happen uh, in your subsystem. And that makes the entire maintainer thing a high stakes game. So there's much higher, if, if, if you do something wrong, or uh, it, the cost of, of doing something wrong is, is much higher. And so as a preventive measure, you, you self-center. And of course, you, you then also impose that control uh, on your own contributors and your sub-maintainers and all that. So it's, especially the entire making things personal, I think is, is a strong force that perpetuates the, the abusive control, the controlling con culture in the, in the Linux kernel kind of down the hierarchy. Um, well, what it also kind of creates by making things personal, you have a bit of a personality cult. There's certain people who've been doing a given subsystem for decades, which also means oh, they're very hard to remove. So personal responsible, they know personally all the history, they have accumulated uh, special knowledge about why things have been done. And so pretty much in every subsystem you have the local toxic person uh, most people know who he is, and he can't be removed. And another thing I've seen uh, quite a bit is that power is not shared. So despite that for years in Kernel Summit, uh, uh, group maintainership was, was kind of heralded as, as the thing, the way to maintain things properly. But if you actually look around, there's a tip which by patch volume is fairly, so the Core x86 tree, but patch volume is fairly little of the kernel. There's the ARM SSC tree, but if you look at it in detail, it's just group maintainership at the top level, and all, most of the uh, platforms below are, are not group maintained. And then there's a few things we do in graphics, but again, yeah, in, in graphics, there's maybe half of the tree is maintained in group maintainership. Act in actuality, uh, and the others are traditional maintainers, that single guy who, who owns that part of the code base. Uh, there's also, uh, also quite a bit of, of not sharing power, of, of more indirectly not sharing power, like not documenting a lot of the implicit assumptions and, and rules. So even as a maintainer with thousands of known patches merged in the kernel, and probably around 10,000 that are reviewed and applied. I don't know what the exact bike shed rule for commit messages in these parts. Like, if I do it like graphics, there's a good chance that someone else gets really pissed at me and tells me he wants the per patch change look somewhere else, or there's some other styling thing that they really insist on or really not insist on. And a lot of these things are just outright not documented. Um, uh, another kind of not sharing power thing is uh, test automation. There uh, fairly often the testing infrastructure is something that the maintainer has, and it's pretty hard to replicate. So uh, at least in my experience, there are CI systems that try to test everything, that tries to type, test patches, and it's slowly getting better. But in large parts, my experience as, as maintainer myself is a lot of the basic checking for like static analysis and stuff like that, it only happens once it's in a real maintainer tree, uh, which means contributors can never figure these problems out on their own, or at least it would be massive amounts of work for them. And that, that obviously makes it fairly hard to, to contribute. And well, we're kind of looking at quality or uh, there's the topic of review. 
there uh, about a year ago, I crunched a bunch of numbers about how review happens. And the fact is that mostly review happens between the maintainer and the contributors, so it's, it's a hierarchical thing. Uh, and not among pays. I think in, in total only about 25% of the patches are peer reviewed and everything else is, is maintainer reviewed. And very often the review or is awfully close, close to an acceptance gauntlet. Like you just go through the motions, respin your patch series 10 times until uh, you've su sufficiently shown to be subordinated to the maintainer and, and finally get your patches accepted. So those are kind of the patterns of, of controlling behavior I see. And uh, before we move on to the next topic, a um, uh, small interruption with how we could do this better. And I'd like to highlight two awesome talks here. Uh, one is Life is Better with Rust's Community Automation from Emily Dunham. I think that was even here at LCA a few years ago. Forgotten the name. Uh, and the second one is Have It Your Way, Maximize Drive Through Contributions by VM Brasseur, uh, which is about one off contributions, but also kind of with the idea in the back of your mind that if you make it uh, an easy and, and uh, helpful and uh, welcoming process for one off contributions, uh, Contributing to your project by regular and re, uh, repeating uh, contributors will also be a, a lot more, uh, a, a much greater experience. And my takeaway from these talks really is the idea of having interactive documentation. So not just having good docs and tooling to enforce them, but when you contribute it, there's like the first pull request or sends a patch, there's a bot who checks the basic things. And every time there's kind of uh, like uh, uh, a code uh, style issue or whatever, uh, the bot maybe even gives you the cleaned up version of that, but also links you directly to the relevant piece of documentation. So that uh, documentation isn't just there, but is as a, as a first time contributor, or in general as a contributor, is interactively discoverable. Um, so, Back to kind of the story, uh, as I said, the, the subsystem, the driver I was maintaining was growing like crazy, was suddenly really relevant, and I started to get this sinking feeling of this is really not how you run a team. And around that time, I was also invited uh, to my first kernel summit. Uh, And I started talking, or I wanted to talk with possible allies, with other maintainers, about how we can do this better, what we need to do to fix this community. And there's a bunch of people who've gone on record with, with various projects uh, and, and statements who looked like they, they, they would be willing to also fight the good fight here and try to change things, have, have someone to chat with, I mean, one thing uh, that was kind of tough for me is that graphics is rather separate. So on my first kernel summit, there was like 100 kernel maintainers, and I knew maybe two, three. So they, from, from my daily work, so they, they, I just didn't know the people because we, we mostly work together with the user space side of graphics, not so much with the kernel at large. And so I started chatting with these maintainers that I figured they could, be, they could help out with fixing this, improving this, following a bit their discussions. And I started getting that thinking feeling again. And uh, I noticed that if it actually gets to the core of what they believe is right and what they want to do, they stop being nice maintainers. So there's statements like, I'm going to make that guy understand that he's wrong in, in a rather uh, threatening way. And this isn't just a disappointment basically because you can cross off a bunch of people you thought would be helpful from your list. It's also a problem because of all the culture thing, there's a high risk of speaking up. 
So you have maybe a few people out of the kernel community who speak up and a bunch of them turn out to be not so helpful. Uh, which brings us to the entire topic of who else is not an alley. And uh, a huge chunk of people who've been around in the kernel community for longer and you chat with them about problematic people or toxic behavior or maybe we should do this better or when the question comes up, so I want to be a kernel contributor, but how do I deal with this? The answer is fairly often, well, it is what it is, and, and you just deal with it. And my opinion, that just makes you complicit in the entire thing. Um, Another huge chunk of people who you can talk with are people who left the kernel community. That is really good because you can compare notes. This, this was rather enlightening for me because when I started chatting with other people who left and we started comparing notes and certain names came up or along the lines of what I called kind of the nice maintainers. Oh, this a shocking reoccurrence of, yeah, such and such is such a disappointment. So they're really great for a self-help group, but they're not really helpful for trying to actually fix the kernel community. And there's a lot of loud quitters and a lot of people who quit a lot more re uh, silently. Um, somewhat pe uh, like people who quit, but not entirely, are burned out maintainers. Kind of maintainers who realize this just doesn't work and it just destroys themselves, it destroys the people. It, 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 uh, they need to get out of this, but they kind of don't want to quit kernel overall, so they just step down as maintainers. And then you can have really good conversations with them, but since they've burned out already, they kind of don't have the energy anymore to, to, to help out fighting the next fight. So again, they're great people to chat with. They're not terribly helpful for trying to fix the community. Uh, another example is graphics itself, so the DRI Dello graphics uh, mailing list. And we've done quite a few things in the past few years in trying to at least make our little corner of the kernel uh, a more useful. Uh, so with the subsystem that spearheaded the uh, rewrite of the kernel documentation system, and then eventually other people got on board two years ago. Uh, we um, we the one subsystem that hands out commit rights, so not just group maintainership with two, three people, but actually a group of uh, committers, kind of more like in a standard uh, project, uh, that work together and have direct access. Uh, on a given part of the kernel. Uh, we enacted just a little bit less than a year ago a code of conduct and uh, we're actually enforcing it. And the surprising thing is that it seems to work. So we had acquired a bunch of problematic kernel maintainers and I honestly expected we need to just ban them. And somehow if you if you make a believable enough threat that they will be kicked out, they certainly start to be uh, reasonable people, or at least a lot more reasonable people. But the thing is also, when you chat with graphics maintainers, they don't want to fix the kernel community. Like, not just me, myself, but like lots of other kernel, uh, kernel graphics maintainers. They, yeah, they're not willing to burn on that pyre. Uh, finally, there's many contributors. And if they even decide to, uh, to contribute to upstream, and I mean, just look at your phones, there's a non-upstream kernel on that. So a lot of companies and contributors just decide this is not worth it. Uh, they do their thing. They go through the review bike shed gauntlet and then they disappear again. So, and there's also uh, like thousands of them. So it's really hard to assemble them into a coalition and, and, and try to get 
try to, to build up uh, a consensus around, around uh, making things better. So one group that you think has, has a really strong incentive to, to fix this mess is the sandwich maintainers because they get the harassment from above and they get the unhappy commit, uh, contributors from below. And a question is like, why don't they change it? Because in, in the past, since I started to talk with people about these topics, I started to get involved with, with other subsystems that realized it's, it's kind of not working for them. They like to do better. Uh, and I noticed a bit of pattern of people start talking about fixing this, and eventually it patters out, and nothing happens. So before we go look into, into kind of the forces that uh, cement the status quo, uh, I, I want to make this slightly less depressing for you. Uh, and so here's a bunch of, of great resources and conferences that I've gone to. Uh, the, just for, for talking with other maintainers, with other community leaders, uh, and, and learning about these topics, learning about uh, books and, and, and things. So I'm going to highlight a few. One is a community leadership summit. Again, Vian Brasseur comes up, and he, John O'Bacon, there's one at OSCON, there's also one at LCA that Cherie uh, led this year. Uh, there's the Maintainer Rati by Jesse Fussell and sponsored by GitHub, that's fairly recently, but great place to talk with other fellow uh, maintainers and community people. In, in general, a lot of conferences have community tracks. So just hanging out there, meeting new people, listening what they have to say is really great. And specifically, uh, I mean, I read tons of books, but one book I'd, I'd like, or one series of books I'd like to highlight, or an author more specifically, I'd like to highlight here in the context of trying to fix an existing community with lots of inertia is Change Management by John Cotter. Uh, Stuart Smith has done a talk, not just about this top, uh, book, but about the topic in general last year here at LCA. So, why is there strong forces for the status quo? Uh, one thing is, this entire kernel uh, mailing list data up thing is somewhat of a spectator sport. Like, Linus has a blow up. Uh, you, you, you're guaranteed to read it on Reddit, on, on Hacker News, on everywhere else. And there's a bit of a thing that, oh, uh, someone else, not me, but someone who I discussed this talk with labeled as abusive performance art. So in a way, doing these, uh, these dramatic blowouts in a way reinforces, again, kind of in personality cult style, uh, the powers that the maintainer wields. And in some extreme cases, it's so bad that there's, there's at least one case I know. Every time a Reddit or Hacker News discussion comes up, his old build up from like five years ago comes up again. So it's not just that, or to take a military term, uh, the spectator sport thing is a force amplifier for, for the abuse that kernel maintainers can dish out, but it also extends it over a long time period. So every time Reddit again has a, yay, Linus has beat up someone uh, discussion, all these old stories get dragged out again. And as such makes it uh, a rather much more high stakes game if you decide to stick out your head. And uh, that leads us to the second thing. Some maintainers are so scared of the next beta and half the scars from the last one that they're essentially unwilling to change anything because that's the default option, that's the most safest option. And that's the least likely option to get them beat up again. So if, if the subsystem starts talking, maybe we should do commi uh, commit rights, or maybe we should do group maintainership. Eventually, it boils down to that subsystem maintainer saying, no, 
uh, I can't afford to do this and tell learners that they're doing things different because what if a regression happened? So they, they're essentially trying to, to prevent or handle their fear by keeping as much as control as possible, which is, of course, again, perpetuating the situation. Oops. What did happen now? Oh, it's back. Sorry. It, it's all good. So, so the next one is flat out job security. A lot of maintainers are employed because they're the bottleneck. So their weekly status report to the manager is, I reviewed so and so many patches. I uh, applied like 20 of those. I've done a good job. I've been useful. And if you're now telling them, look, you're not longer going to be the bottleneck. We're going to do this with commit rights, and we're going to replace you. And essentially, your job is just to be the one guy who takes the blame when Linus freaks out. Uh, they need to find a new job. And if you're exhausted in, in kind of a, a, a toxic system, the least thing you probably want to do is maybe find an entirely new employer, or at least have this, or a slightly less work, have a discussion with your manager about, hey, I'm not got longer going to do this. Is there something else I could, should be doing for your company that you think is worth the amount of money you're throwing at me? And one case of job security in, in extreme is our Linux Foundation. So one of the reasons, at least, uh, Linux Foundation was founded is because a bunch of people were fairly unhappy with how much power Linus Torvalds was yielding and wanted to make sure he's working for a neutral employer. And uh, so the Linux Foundation, it's, Linux Foundation does a lot more cloudy stuff nowadays, so this is a lot less important nowadays. But still, a, a big reason Linux Foundation exists is because the very steep hierarchy. And of course, as long as this very steep hierarchy exists, a bunch of the top kernel contributors, uh, kernel maintainers, uh, provide value to Linux Foundation as providing the exclusive access to, to the top maintainers. So there's a mutual beneficial situation for top kernel maintainers and Linux Foundation in upkeeping this strict steep hierarchy. So, oh, that's the wrong button. Sorry about that. Uh, this is a quick interlude, a bit of rant of me uh, about governance, because I think this not just happened with Linux Foundation. <coughs> I mean, I'm the secretary of the XORG Foundation. Um, I've heard a few old stories. Luckily, I wasn't around. But the gist of it is, sooner or later, conflicts of interest will happen. So if you entangle kind of the business side, the consulting side of of your software, of your community, with governance of your community. After maybe 10 years, your community has moved on a bit, but the business is maybe stuck. And so instead of supporting your community as much as possible, your, your governance structure has now the primary goal of keeping the people employed who might no longer need to be doing that job. And so in my opinion, uh, for community governance, you should have a strict separation between uh, the governance and employing people. So the foundation can do stuff like run internships or uh, be the legal framework for conferences and things like that, but not maybe provide service and infrastructure, but not employ people to actually work on the code because sooner or later uh, they might no longer be doing uh, work that's in the best interest of the project overall, of the community overall. And second also, I think voting rights should be as broad as possible. So anytime you do have a shift in your community, you're not just ignoring the new people that maybe just come in as, as individual contributors, hobbyists, or, or small companies. So status quo are sad factors. Maintainers simply benefit from the current situation and are don't have a whole lot of reasons to change things. So where does it leave us? Uh, 
one is for contributors. Uh, I'm not going to like chat around that you shouldn't join the kernel community because it's definitely a massive career boost. It has been for me. I talked with Atrici and Jones, who also said uh, it makes it so much easier to find the next job or a full-time employment. But always have your exit plan. Because if you stick out your head, and sooner or later you will stick out your head, uh, it will get job down. And the other side is for maintainers, and that brings us to the title of, of my talk, uh, Burning Down the Castle. You could read that like, uh, start a revolution and, and burn it all down. I don't think that would be a good option for free software overall. So my, my plea to maintainers is, oh, please fix this before the revolution happens. Because if it does, it's not going to be pretty. And I think Linux is going to be much, much worse off. And uh, maybe if you've seen John Corbett's talk about the different systems that get eventually replaced, uh, personally, I think this is the one thing that is blindsided in the kernel community. Uh, they, at least the current leadership refuses to see it and, and gets defensive. So uh, share your powers, uh, drop maintainer privileges as much as possible. So don't make your reviewer and, and your rejection powers special. Uh, document everything, including all the hidden assumptions. Try to at automate it as much as possible in an interactive way. And, and most important of all, uh, care about the people. Because if you don't have people, you're not going to be left with a lot of project. I've done last year a talk about what we've done in the graphics subsystem in this area. So maybe watch that and apply it to your own thing. Uh, the conclusion of that uh, talk is essentially uh, be a steward for your community and don't be a lord that rules with an iron fist or your feet down because that tends to not well too well, uh, end, end too well, historically speaking. So that's the story of how I became a kernel maintainer and learned that it's not pretty and that I think it's not really fixable, at least not anytime soon. So questions? <laughs> Um, am I coming through? We have a few minutes for questions, so one or two questions. And as you consider what you're going to ask, I'd just like you to reflect on the definition of question. And yeah. Anyone? I have some backup slides with really preachy sermons. So <laughs> make it read questions. They're much more interesting. So uh, the question least, was, yeah. how and why did it came to be this way? I honestly don't know. Um, uh, I, I guess, yeah. I, I guess one point is definitely that people back like 20, 30 years ago didn't know as much about how to build working communities as we do nowadays. And I would also say by the time people started speaking up, about these problems and starting to express their unhappiness. And by the time lots of people just stopped caring about upstream, uh, the power structure was so entrenched with, with all the reasons I'll, I'll try to lay out that it is really hard to change it. So not much of an answer, but um, you picking? No, you're picking. <laughs> oh, Matthew. For those of us who have been uh, kernel maintainers in the past and are not currently kernel maintainers, uh, never continue to contribute, and also, uh, you know, I, I'm not a maintainer, but I don't know your stats, um, and don't like 
limit one person from the future to just limit the work of three I can you paraphrase that uh, somehow? Oh yeah, <laughs> paraphrase. So so if you've been a kernel maintainer and stepped out, should you step back in, trying to fix it roughly? Um, I have a really hard time recommending people join the kernel community or rejoin the kernel community. Um, one of the reasons I stepped down as kernel maintainer, besides that we just had built up great people through commit rights and ready for maintainership, so I wanted to give them a piece of the fun, was also that I think, well, in, in kind of leading a real team and, and that kind of sense, not getting beat up by uh, Linus Thomas. So just for clarification, I started handing over to a new team after we enacted the code of conduct and after I was really sure we could enforce it, at least in the graphics subsystem. So I didn't like expose people to abuse intentionally. Um, it was simply that within graphics, I think we've achieved a lot to, to make it better. And outside of graphics, I think the overall understanding of the situation and of the real problem is just not even there that you can start talking about solutions. So I could talk about what I think needs to be done, and it would make a great Twitter headline, and it would totally distract from the content of the talk. So I think the only thing you can do is talk with people and listen to them and, and get them to the point they, they agree that just apologizing for the current situation is not a good thing and does make you complicit. That's, that's something I've done in graphics with a bunch of people, it takes years. But maybe if you can create a, a critical group of, of people in a, on a big enough group of people so they can defend each another, maybe another subsystem can, can start to enact real change. But personally, I think the time frame for that, and I would say if this happens, it will make my, my talk a uh, sounding success, is five years at least. And I think we're out of time. We are now out of time. Please join me once more in thanking Daniel for his talk. Thanks a lot for, for listening.